are willful, you have those 50% FBAR penalties that can add up. 50% uh, of your account balance uh, six times can certainly wipe out anyone's wealth pretty quickly. So there we're going to want to go and do that. And that will be a 20, your FBAR penalty will be capped at 27.5% of a high balance in any year or 50% if you happen to be on that bad boy bank account uh, where of uh, people who have not, um, people who have uh, in the accounts like Sovereign and Panama, uh, HSBC India, uh, there's about 43 banks right now on the list. Um, and here I am going through all of them. These are the, uh, if you look on the screen, I'm going through all the ones right here, just to recap. Uh, if you're non-willful, right, you have your informational. All right, now I'm told we're getting, I think we might be getting audio on YouTube. Okay, yep, we are getting audio on YouTube, okay. Yeah, I apologize to everybody. So let me just recap for the people who are watching on YouTube. Uh, we just went over right now the offshore programs, and these are for people who are non-willful, your informational reporting only, your streamlined foreign offshore procedure, that's a 0% penalty, and your streamlined domestic offshore procedure, which is a 5% penalty. And we just talked about FBAR willfulness and non-willfulness. And now we're going to talk a little bit about um, uh, uh, the offshore, the OVDP, the full OVDP, uh, for those who are paid 27.5%. And then also the one that's a little tricky, the OVDP with an opt-out. And this is, uh, this is an interesting one. With an OVDP and an opt-out, this is for people for whatever reasons. And there are some strategic reasons that come into play, especially when there's foreign commercial real estate or um, client is not all that risk averse and would like to challenge something in an opt-out where we think, well, maybe we're not 100% innocent, but we think that a chance of if there's go going to be penalties applied, it would be non-willful penalties at $10,000 per year as opposed to those horrific 50% penalties. And sometimes it really makes sense. Now, in an opt-out, you're going to do a full audit and you could really strike out and uh, get hit with some significant penalties. But that's not the end of the story because in order for those penalties to mean anything, unlike a tax debt, the IRS must sue you in federal district court to convert that Title 31 penalty in something that would actually mean something other than just taking your refunds or federal payments that you might be entitled to. Now, what are the what are the alternatives? And when I first heard of of the 2012 program, which is this is really what this this is or the 2011 program, which is the current rules are somewhat derivative of that. Um, I said, well, my first thought was thinking of, well, let's just avoid the whole thing, right? Why do we need to, why do I need to have my clients uh, go through this program, which is going to be expensive when we can just file missing uh, FBARs, file amending returns? That's what I was thinking. And the IRS at the time said, no, uh, don't do it. We don't want you to do it. Then I happened to get a call from a friend of mine who said, don't repeat this. Well, here it is. I'm repeating it because I think it bears repeating because it's pretty important for you to hear. He said, Anthony, um, you're not doing soft disclosures, are you? I said, nah, I was thinking of it, but it doesn't make sense. They said not to do it and they have control. It's their, you know, it's really their, their field. You don't want to, to upset them. He says, good, because I have, a, I have a really good resource that says the IRS is, going, is looking to criminally prosecute tax advisors who tell their clients to go through a soft disclosure. And I, I breathe a huge sigh of relief and uh, glad I was doing the right thing and never advise a client to do the wrong thing. And this is the other reason why I thought it a really foolish idea. There's these attorneys and professionals out there advising people to make the soft disclosure. Well, here's the thing, you know, if they're advising one person not to make a soft disclosure, they're probably advising somebody else. So now all the IRS needs to do is find that one taxpayer that made a soft disclosure, trace it back to the tax professional, and now the IRS will have the database of every other, every other client that person represented. So you're opening up this huge can of worm. And when we talk to people to say, well, do you want to use one of the programs or not? Um, you know, quite honestly, I would advise someone to do nothing over making a soft disclosure. I don't know if I'm quite allowed to say that. Well, I want you to comply, but I just want you to realize that you're really risking everything because here, this is what goes out the window when you make a soft disclosure. A any plausible deniability. You know, at that point, the IRS knows you knew what to do, but yet you went ahead and did something you weren't supposed to do. 
And we've talking, we have spoken with uh, um, FR examiners, but they're just regular tax examiners and nothing special about it, but they're just um, assessing the FR penalties. And we've talked to some of them who say that, yep, we hammer them. We And even in a case where the person actually didn't know their tax advisor made a soft disclosure, they still hammered them with two willful penalties. I believe it was two willful penalties. And it, the auditor didn't want to hit them with anything, but the technical services uh, said, told the person to hit them with two uh, willful FR penalties. So they mean it. Don't do the soft disclosure. And if you have, by the way, if you have done a soft disclosure, it's not too late. You can use one of the programs. And I would strongly advise that to do that. Next question that comes up a lot. Am I going to jail? How to answer this one. I would say your risk of going to jail could be for something else entirely, maybe for insider trading or obstruction of justice. The IRS only has about room for about 3,000 indictments a year, and there's millions of taxpayers in noncompliance. The IRS really isn't interested in sending people to jail. They have to send people to jail to send a message. But if you get yourself into a program, you're really there, there's, the, the chances are just so small for an IRS for an IRS issue unless you lie on a disclosure. Right? You can't lie in a disclosure. Our next question is, will I raise flags, right? Uh, people want to know, if I go through the disclosure, will, will I raise a flag? Am, am I going to make my, my life more difficult or not by going through the program? The answer to this is, well, you already raised a red flag, right? By having foreign accounts, You've already raised the red flag. The, the question is, is do you want to put that red flag down? Right? And so that's sort of the better, clearer way to look at the issue. Um, the IRS is looking for people, you, you know, the IRS um, is looking for people who just want to start getting done, things done correctly now. Um, and they're not looking to go back in ancient history. They're just looking at a closer time period. So get that closer time period corrected and you're fine. And this next question is somewhat related to the same one. Um, people ask this, well, I have a black mark on my name, but somewhere in your IRS transcript, it's going to say, oh, and here's the permanent record. This is a bad taxpayer, right? Well, it doesn't work like that. There's <coughs> only two statuses with the IRS, compliance or non-compliance. There is nothing else. The voluntary disclosure programs were specifically designed to allow a process for those who are non-compliant to become compliant. So if you have a black name, this will remove or the black mark. Um, the question we have, will I have problems leaving and entering the United States? Inside a program, no. Outside a program, possibly. The IRS and the US uh, Customs and Homeland Security are exchanging databases right now. They're not 100%, but they're probably gonna get better at it. A big question here, will I be able to access my foreign bank account? Inside a program, usually the IRS will not do anything uh, to block your access to the foreign account. And usually it will be the bank blocking it, but once we can prove, oh, we are in compliance, we, we have started a disclosure with the IRS, the freeze releases. Now, outside a program, you're going to have some difficulties. And the reason is because the bank is trying to show the IRS that they're being a good bank. And so that is actually could be your biggest challenge. The IRS could say, well, no, we're fine with you getting your money. We want to get paid, right? And the bank is my, sometimes the more difficult person to persuade if you were late in getting a program or you did a, did a program after the fact. So in a program, we have not had anybody. Uh, anybody who's gotten into the program, we haven't had anybody. We have had threats of a bank being frozen. Then we were able to send letters to, uh, we've been able to send letters to the bank to say, here's proof that our client is in a program. Please don't freeze their bank accounts. And it hasn't happened yet. And this is the next one. You, some of you might be getting a W-9 letter and um, want to know, will I have to sign a W-9 letter? The answer to that is yes. Um, but the re but there is you want to be in a program if you're going to sign it, right? <laughs> because if you sign it and you're not a program, you know, you got a little bit of a problem. Um, and sort of related to the last question, the danger of not s signing the W-9 comes from the bank first, right? The banks are sending these forms and they're trying to comply with the FACA uh, intergovernment agreements their country signed. 
Uh, so the banks are really the ones who, who are doing it. And so by not signing it, will the will the bank necessarily send your money or your information to the IRS? Maybe not initially, but what they could do is is a potentially worse problem is freeze your assets. So I would say you would want to sign that W-9 letter and get into a program. Now, after we explain the streamlined program to people, and it's much easier than the full OVDP, um, the question is asked, if I go, the question people ask is, if I go through the streamlined program, can I still be audited? And the answer to this is yes, but consider this, your risk of audit already exists. Um, and if you get audited after making a streamlined submission, your audit will be a thousand times better than if you did not use a program or a thousand and one times, something like that. But seriously, it is so much better to make a disclosure. And that's why we take our streamlined submission so seriously when we are preparing the returns. Uh, we are incredibly thorough. We're making these as audit proof as possible so that if the audit comes, we are just grabbing a folder off, you know, the folder's already there. The audit file is already there, ready to go, uh, to go to the auditor. This is, here's our calculations. Here's all our paperwork. This is why we have these figures. There's nothing missing. So the audit should go extremely well um, if you do get audited. Um, now, if you're not in a program at all and you get audited, now we have an uphill battle. We have a few of those cases where people have not disclosed and now they're they're under audit. A lot of our leverage has gone away, but not entirely. Um, it's just a little easier if we're in a program and then get audited. A, a lot easier, in fact. And here's a question. How long is this going to take? And I know there's some people on this call who are in a program right now. They're doing it themselves or they have a, another uh, counsel. And they might be banging their head to say, why is this taking so long? So it is taking a long time. Um, and we actually have some cases, um, believe it or not, from 2009 uh, right now. And uh, the IRS admitted that uh, they sat on them um, and they were lost files. And we decided maybe we weren't going to mention anything about it because we were getting close to the statute of limitations on the FR assessments. And then, when you know it, right before that FR uh, limitation was going to run out, the IRS called to say, hey, we have your case. Um, so we have some old cases, and those are really from 2009 that, that sort of got lost. But really what we're seeing when we're, people are making FR only or FR with amended returns, there we're looking at about a three to six month uh, from start to finish when people hire us or what we would consider as reasonable for somebody else. And when you're doing a streamlined submission, and this is, again, this is because you want to make that streamlined submission bulletproof. Right? You're just not filing returns like you know, H&R Blockwood where, hey, garbage in, garbage out. Who cares? All that happens. What's the big deal? No, 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 no. But it happens, we want to be on top of it. So there, the streamlines do take a lot. Usually, we're, do, we're getting our submission in about six, seven months. And then, so we're about 12 months before the IRS close it out. Uh, that's that's about right. Could be 14 months, something like that. It's really not out of the ordinary, especially when you have some foreign, complicated foreign accounts or delays in getting things. Uh, with a full OVDP, we're talking one to three years. Um, seriously, to get that in. Uh, these are incredibly complicated things to get. And there's really, and that's eight years we're doing. Um, so, you know, with the, with the foreign accounts, you don't have a 1099 or K1 where you're just plugging in the number. You know, you're developing the K1. You're developing the 1099. And then uh, Congress, in its infinite wisdom, has created laws to make it punitive for those to invest overseas. And that's just the truth. Uh, foreign uh, foreign life insurance, foreign mutual funds, they're all taxed at rates and, and the requirements are so much worse than anything domestic. And it's a dirty little secret of our tax code of how protectionist it is. With a uh, OVDP with an opt-out there, we're talking two to five years. Um, and we were trying to count up the OVDP uh, examiners that that we recognized, um, and we think there's only about 12 <laughs> across the country. Um, we've run into the same people again and again, and, and I'm pretty sure there's about 12 uh, that we run into, and these are people, and uh, the OVDP examiners are really the people at the top of their game, and there's just not enough of them. I mean, not only does it take an incredible amount of talent, it also takes you know, an incredible amount of raw talent. It takes a lot of years to hone that raw talent. And so those people are by far incredibly sharp. And normally, and typically what we see is they don't have the vendetta to assess the willful penalties. They're more, when we're talking to them, they do other audits too. So they see this FBAR penalty as being really out of line. Really the person we need to convince isn't the auditor, but actually the technical services. 
The technical services is part of the exam and they support the auditor and they're the ones who never see the people that they're dealing with. And so they're more than fine. So yeah, hit them with the 50% penalty. They have it, they can pay it. You know, those are the people. And so those are people we have to go and appeal when finding doesn't go our, our way. And there's an FBAR penalty um, appeals process. We're not going to talk about that because that'd be another hour or so. But actually, we're on uh, we're on slide 20, and there's only 25, so we're getting near the end. Uh, of course, there, if you want to ask a questions, I do believe uh, we we yeah. If you have any questions, if you're on WebEx, you just go to the chat. Uh, if you want to uh, if you want to send your question to webinar at irsmedic.com, you can do that. Um, and I believe YouTube is has a commenting as well. So you have three options there if you do have questions. Um, and. Uh, here is a next question is what happens if the IRS contacts me? Well, the answer is nothing. If you're in a program represented, you don't say anything except here's the name and number of my attorney. If you're not in a program, you might want to call a criminal tax defense attorney. Um, and I would recommend Michael Mills in uh, Michael Mins in Houston. He runs a, a bit of money um, that would probably put any FBAR penalty, uh, make F any FBAR penalty look small. So that's really one of the big reasons why you want to get into a program. Outside of a program, you know, the IRS has this leverage against you, this the threat of criminal prosecution. And they're going to, you know, they're going to send, they're going to prosecute husband and, and spouse, even if the spouse doesn't know anything going on. Um, they're just going to do it to put pressure on you to pressure you into taking a horrible plea deal that involves some jail time and horrible penalties as well. So that's really what you want to do by getting into the program. Um, you get so much more leverage um, there. Um, and the question we have is, can the IRS go back more than three years um, in a streamline? And can they go back more than eight years? Um, can they go back more than three years in a streamline? Sure. But really here it's about resource allocation. If you have a certification from an attorney saying that you're non-willful, chances are incredibly remote. They're really not interested in it. You know, the IRS has identified 10,000 people that have made soft disclosures. And these are for amounts that are, that are not chicken feed. This, these are for serious amounts. The IRS wants to get to those people. They just don't have the manpower. So they're just sort of managing which ones are the statute of limitations coming up on. And so the ones that the statutes are expiring quickest on, they're trying to get to. But the rest of the people, they'll get to eventually. A lot of the OVTP examiners are being trained to become exactly that auditor uh, for the people who are doing this off-disclosure. Now, Can the IRS go back in eight years? I really don't know how. Uh, I guess if you never file a return, it's possible. But in this case, it's just not likely at all. Um, you know, you know that um, the OVDP is is in all the voluntary disclosure programs are for those who've made mistakes and want to be good from here forward. That is what the IRS is looking for. Okay. Oh, these are now these. Uh, we sent our invite, so here we are going to get to. People have sent us questions, um, and so ahead of time we have three questions submitted so far uh, from people. So I've made the slides for them. And our first slide uh, comes from somebody in Costa Rica, and they would like to get into the Streamline Foreign Offshore Program. Um, but they read, I'm condensing, the, I'm condensing their question, but they read something where I said you need to be in compliance in Costa Rica and other countries in order to, be, to get in the Streamline. And they want to know, is this going to be a problem? And I didn't realize what they were asking and sort of until a few minutes ago, because um, my answer is no, you, you have to get into compliance, you, you know, not as long as you get in compliance with the country you're living in, you can go through the streamlined program. That is one of the requirements. You must be in tax compliance in Costa Rica in this case. And now I think what they're asking is how how do I get in compliance with Costa Rica? Um, well, we you know what we work with the uh, um, uh, uh, tax firms and, and CPAs, uh, um, uh, even advisors from around the world in every country. It's it's incredibly exciting. And actually in Costa Rica, we would have uh, we have a couple different firms. Uh, if you're looking for a big firm, we have uh, Arias and Munoz. We use you know we work with them. Uh, they're they're great, and they really certainly know their stuff on how to be in compliance with Costa Rica. And then with them, they do certain tasks. We have there's a lot of in Costa Rica, you know specifically there's a ton of uh, corporation filings to do, corporation lookups to do, um, and there's there's a lot of legwork to do that's a little bit difficult for us to do in Connecticut. So we have a few you know people on the ground to help us out all around the world. Um, so that's um, that I hope answers. The question. If not, again, just just chat or uh, send an email. We can give you some more clarification on that. 
<clears throat> now, this was somebody from, I think, Switzerland. Um, so I'm just condensing her question a little bit. Uh, my facts uh, are those of non-willfulness. I entered into the OVDP and now seek transitional acceptance into the streamline. Can I avoid the 5% penalty by each demonstrating my total lack of willfulness? Now, this is a, a question where the answer is not what you want to hear. And to say the question another way is, can complete lack of willfulness negate that 5% penalty if I'm in this, if, if I'm in the SDOP, that's the Streamlined Domestic Offshore Program? In this case, if she was still living in Switzerland, she'd be golden. She would file the transitional and she would go through the SFOP 0% penalty. That would be awesome. But unfortunately, she's living in the U.S., and so she has to take the 5% penalty. There's simply no way around it. The only thing is, it's better than it used to be. Um, that's about all I could say, is really before the, the previous uh, streamlined in the 2012 program applied to so few people, and uh, I think the only penalty, and so many people wouldn't even get that 5%, and then otherwise you're looking at a 125 for a small account balance. So the 5% still stinks. It's a lot better than uh, what could be. Okay, now this this is such a long question. Um, and by the way, I am not the one who answered this one. I had to go um, to my people upstairs. Michelle Wynn and, and Robert Hansen uh, helped me with this one. And I think even Sean O'Connor helped me with this one because I got a little lost and they were really uh, able to help me out. Um, so here's the, here's the question and the next slide will be the answer. I am a U.S. person in Canada. I am a trustee of a Canadian discretionary trust that receives dividends from my uh, Canadian professional corporation. My mom is a settler of the trust who is a U.S. person. The sole beneficiaries are my three Canadian board kids who are not U.S. persons. Is any part of those dividends attributed to me because I am trustee? Trust specifically excludes anyone but the three kids from owning any part of the trust. By the way, I know the PC needs to file Form 5471. I would say pretty good on knowing the PC needs to file that Form 5471. That's sort of a hidden form. If you own a foreign corporation, it's a big form, and it can be really complicated, and that's really why um, some of the, the, the headaches involved in making disclosure and with your foreign compliance can get out of control. Um, so knowing that 5471, good job on that. So here's the answer, and this is about it. This was the the, the committee uh, came up with this answer, and I added maybe maybe two cents. I added to this answer. Um, so again, if you, if this doesn't make sense to you, please again uh, send an email to webinar at irsmedic.com or just <laughs> raise your hand in the chat box wherever you are who asked this question. It does not appear as if the children would receive automatic citizenship, U.S. citizenship, which is good, right? So now we don't have to worry about whatever income they get. But our quick review would indicate that all income of the trust is attributed to your mother, right? And she's a U.S. person. We assume she's still alive. Um, the trustee would have the obligation under the trust to file the required reporting forms for the trust, uh, but the trustee would not be treated as having any income from the trust. Okay? And I think that's probably what you assumed, um, other than the payments actually made to you in compensation for your services, right? Which, if you took any, I don't know if you, you really took any. Um, you would, however, have a requirement to file the FBARs uh, reporting for the trust. We're assuming some some uh, bank accounts associated. There must be, as would uh, your mother, your settler. Also, here's the thing. Um, you, uh, you have a requirement to file Form 3520A. So those are the questions we have. I'm going to, I know we have a little bit of a delay. Uh, so I'm going to give people to, uh, a few few minutes to ask any questions. Or I'm going to give about 30 seconds for people to see if anything comes up because people might have a question, take some time to type. Um, other, than, other than that, we did, wow, I did talk really fast. Wow. I should slow this down on replay. Is no the comments audio on open? Kenton. We're doing good. Uh, nothing on WebEx. Okay. Well, again, guys, I am so excited that we had a chance to do this. And again, if you think of a question later, I'm so glad so many professionals were on this too. That's it's just really, uh, it feels great to be able to help people out. Um, so again, you have any other questions, uh, you can you can send an email to info at irsmedic.com uh, or webinar at irsmedic.com. Um, look us up and thank, thanks again and keep your eye out for more. Uh, we're probably going to be doing one on FBAR penalties soon. I think it's going to be a next one that we're going to do. Uh, a lot of uh, updates with that. So again, this is Anthony Parent for Parent, Parent, and Win LLP, the IRS Medic. And I thank you for joining us today.